tonight. South warns. South Korea urges North Korea an immediate cease of illegal actions in the involvement of Russian war in Ukraine. Pacing up. Trump and Harris make final pushes in key battleground states with only two weeks the election day. Air strikes continue. Israel launches new strikes on Lebanon and northern Gaza, killing civilians and injuring dozens. And busing breakthrough. Colombian scientists develop novel food supplement to protect bees from pesticides. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. Is other than on a world news tonight. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. With the latest updates across the globe for this Tuesday, I'm Amasha Fernando. And we start off the bulletin with the involvement in Russia Ukraine war of the North Korean. A strong denunciation from the Defense Ministry in South Korea came today amidst rampant reports of North Korean troop involvements in the Russia's war against Ukraine. A long line of soldiers are waiting to receive their uniforms and equipment while speaking in Korean. The Ukrainian Center for Strategic Communication and Information Security released the video on its social media channels on Saturday, saying the footage shows North Korean troops gearing up at a training ground in Russia's Far East. The center also released a questionnaire that appears to have been prepared by Russia for North Korean soldiers to provide measurements for military uniforms, including hats and shoes. This comes after South Korea's intelligence agency on Friday confirmed that North Korea had deployed around 1,500 special forces troops to Russia. Over the weekend, the National Intelligence Service even revealed three pictures, including a black and white satellite image depicting a Russian vessel departing from the North Korean port of Chongjin, which is believed to be carrying North Korean soldiers. As more and more evidence supports North Korea's military deployment to Russia, South Korea's defense ministry on Monday strongly criticized the North. It called on the regime to immediately cease its actions, saying that the military will take necessary measures to protect the safety of Korean citizens. When asked if South Korea plans to supply lethal weapons to Ukraine, the ministry spokesperson refrained from providing a direct answer, but said the government is open to all possibilities and that they'll review necessary measures while closely monitoring the situation. Also on Monday, South Korea's foreign ministry called in the Russian ambassador to Seoul, to protest against Moscow's military cooperation with Pyongyang. Seoul's first vice foreign minister, Kim hong gyun warned Russia's top envoy that South Korea will sternly respond by using all available means through cooperation with the international community. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky has warned that greater North Korean involvement will be detrimental to everyone should its troops become trained for modern warfare. In a video address on Sunday, he called for the international community to take a tougher stance against the North, amid continued speculation that it will become more involved in Russia's war against Ukraine. Meanwhile, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin met with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky during an unannounced visit to the Ukraine. His visit signaled solidarity with Kyiv just two weeks ahead of a U.S. presidential election that is causing uncertainty over the future of Western support. Austin met with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and Defense Minister Rustam Omarov while in Kyiv to discuss Ukraine's weapons needs and how the U.S. can continue to support the country's military over the next year. After the meeting, Zelensky wrote on X that he discussed expanding the use of long-range strike capabilities against Russia's military targets. A U.S. defense official said that during their meeting, Austin emphasized to Zelensky the importance of Ukraine defending the territory it has taken inside Russia's Kursk region and capitalizing on those gains as well as fending off the Russians in the eastern Ukrainian city of Pokrovs. They also discussed how Ukraine can show up its manpower as the military has struggled lately with force regeneration and recruitment. The defense officials said that much of Austin's later meeting with Umarov and Ukrainian Armed Forces Commander Alexander Sirisky was also focused on Kursk and the officials drilled down on military planning there for the next several months. Also adding that the Secretary's visit was also meant to serve as a moment for him to step back and look at the arc of the US-Ukraine relationship over the last two and a half years of war. The official also noted that it was not a victory lap, however. 
the Ukrainians are in very tough situation against the Russians heading into winter. That is, despite the heavy Western sanctions imposed on Russia's economy in response to its invasion, billions of dollars worth of military equipment the US has surged to Ukraine and the multinational coalitions that the Biden administration railed from the earliest days of the war to help Ukrainian troops beat back Russian advances. Loud explosions were heard in the Ukrainian capital of Kyiv in the early hours yesterday local time in a stark illustration of the daily bombardments the country still faces more than 2.5 years into Moscow's grinding war. City authorities say their defenses have been activated. Austin and the Biden administration more broadly sees multinational coalitions as a key aspect of his legacy as defense secretary, particularly the Ukraine Defense Contact Group, an alliance of 57 countries and the European Union that Austin first convened two months into the war to coordinate immediate military aid to Ukraine. Russia is hosting this year's three-day annual BRICS summit in the Russian Republic of Tatarstan. Amidst heightened geopolitical tension, BRICS, a group designed to be, bring together developing countries to challenge Western dominance, will kick off its largest summit yet in the city of Kazan with five new member states this year. China's Xi Jinping, India's Narendra Modi, Turkey's Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, and 24 state leaders are expected to attend, including the newest members, Egypt, Ethiopia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. And despite speculation that the Ukraine war and an international arrest warrant would isolate Putin, more countries are seeking membership, with Turkey, Azerbaijan and Malaysia already having made formal applications. The first ever summit of BRICS Plus will likely discuss wars in Ukraine and the Middle East and improving economic and cultural cooperation within the bloc. Now, Russia's President Vladimir Putin is set to hold multiple bilateral talks on the sidelines with speculation that Russia's use of North Korean troops for its war in Ukraine will be on the agenda. With the addition of the new member states, the BRICS Plus now has a combined population of some 3.5 billion people, accounting for about 45% of the global population, while the group's economies combined make up about 30% of the global economy. Over in New Mexico, at least two people have died and hundreds have been rescued after extreme overnight rainfall brought severe flooding, stranding motorists and sweeping cars away. Tonight, a trail of mud and destruction in Roswell, New Mexico, after the city received more than a third of its annual rainfall in just a few hours. Y'all, this is insane! Two people declared dead with dozens taken to hospitals. The National Guard joining state police and local agencies to rescue more than 300 from the rushing waters. Danny Ford says he woke up to water inside his home. Landford later joining others to help rescue neighbors stuck in their cars. I am sitting on the roof of my cop car. Even the county sheriff having to climb on top of his vehicle as a wall of water came rushing through town. That is the side of my truck. With the water receding, the governor now declaring a state of emergency to mobilize resources and emergency funds. In the aftermath, climate experts taking notice as the storm broke a 24-hour rainfall record that stood for more than a century. A day of unrest in Maputo, Mozambique, as police fired tear gas at protesters who were demonstrating against the killing of opposition members and what they say is electoral fraud. Mozambique police fired tear gas at protesters in the capital Maputo on Monday. Hundreds gathered at the scene where two opposition party figures were shot dead after a disputed election. Early on Saturday, gunmen killed an opposition lawyer and a party official in their car in Maputo, raising tensions ahead of a planned national strike. Independent presidential candidate Venancio Mondlane, who organized the strike, told protesters to go home after the clashes with police. In the past, Mozambican police have used live ammunition at political protests. The full results of Mozambique's October 9 national election are expected this week. Early results show that the ruling party, Frelimo, is set for another win. But opposition candidates say the poll was rigged. Frelimo has ruled the southern African country since 1975. It has been accused of electoral fraud by opposition leaders, civil society and election observers, which it denies. U.S.-based observers said the poll did not meet international standards for democratic elections. Mozambique's Electoral Commission has declined to comment on accusations of fraud. 
Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House now, at the race for the president tightens further. Former President Donald Trump campaigned in storm-ravaged Western North Carolina amidst fallout from controversial comments he made in Pennsylvania. Vice President Kamala Harris campaigned in Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania in a series of events aimed at appealing to women and Republican voters. Former President Trump playing defense in North Carolina. He's won the state twice before, but polls now show a coin flip contest. Neither Trump nor the RNC chairman saying today they'd seen any indication this election won't be legitimate. But just hours later, Trump still suggesting without evidence the election could be tainted by fraud. Trump also visiting Asheville, hard hit by Hurricane Helene, where he was pressed about his false claims about the FEMA response and threats FEMA workers have received. It all comes after Trump campaigned in Battleground, Pennsylvania. If we win Pennsylvania, we win the whole damn thing, right? But raising eyebrows with this lewd digression about Arnold Palmer, spending 12 minutes talking about the golf legend in his hometown of Latrobe. Trump also holding a photo op at a Philly area McDonald's, working the drive through window to pre-screened customers. We love you. Come here. Thank you. And scooping out French fries. You got the salt on it. Saying he doesn't believe the vice president worked at McDonald's for a summer in college. Harris responding today. Meanwhile, billionaire Elon Musk, who promised to give away $1 billion each day until November's election to someone who signs his online petition, raises questions about the legality of the payments. The first check went to an attendee at Musk's America PAC event in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania on Saturday, aimed at rallying supporters behind Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump. The winner was a man named John Dreher, according to event staff. The First Amendment protects free speech, and the Second Amendment protects the right to keep and bear arms. The money is the latest example of the Tesla and SpaceX CEO using his extraordinary wealth to influence the tightly contested presidential race between Trump and his Democratic rival, Vice President Kamala Harris. But questions about the legality of Musk's cash payments abounded over the weekend, as election law experts pointed to various provisions in federal law that prohibited making cash payments to voters. It is a federal crime to pay people with the intention of inducing or rewarding them to cast a vote or to get registered, an offense punishable by prison time. Attendees of Saturday's event had to sign the petition, which allows America PAC to garner contact details for more potential voters that it can work to get to the polls for Trump. Musk, ranked by Forbes as the world's richest person, so far has supplied at least $75 million to America PAC, according to federal disclosures, making the group a crucial part of Trump's bid to regain the White House. Also in the U.S., four people, including a child, are dead after a helicopter struck a communications tower and erupted into a fireball in Houston. Authorities are investigating how the private aircraft struck a radio tower shortly after takeoff. No one on the ground was injured. Get out the, way. Let's go. Let's go. the fireball crashing into an open field near a residential area. No one on the ground was hurt. Our Houston station, KTRK's traffic reporter Don Armstrong, saying the radio tower is hard to see even in daytime. It's not painted well, and the lights are not the strobes that some of the towers around town have on them. So if you know where the tower is, you navigate around it. But in this case, apparently, that was not the case. Three days before the incident, the FAA posted a notice warning that some of the tower's lights were, quote, unserviceable. In this surveillance video, it appears at least one light on the tower is on as the chopper approaches from the right. Updating you on the conflict in the Middle East now. Israel forces are expanding their offensive in northern Gaza and Lebanon. 
In Beirut, an Israel strike outside Lebanon's largest public hospital killed at least 13 people, including a child. Even by Gazan standards, Beit Lahia has become a unique nightmare. Nearly 90 people killed in this one small city in one weekend. This area has been largely cut off. The United Nations said today Israel has been preventing aid from getting in, something the Israelis denied. Today, 50 trucks carrying aid came into the north from Jordan, according to the IDF. Israeli forces have also encircled hospitals and shelters for displaced people. Across Israel's northern border, many in Lebanon now worry they'll suffer the same fate as those in Gaza. The massacres that they've committed in Gaza are now being carried out here in Lebanon, said this Lebanese man, destroying homes and causing displacement. This is well known and obvious. But U.S. diplomats say they're racing to put a halt to the fighting. That began when Hezbollah fired on Israel in solidarity with Hamas, a day after the group's terror attacks on Israel last October 7th. The Biden administration's special envoy, Amos Hochstein, was in Beirut today. Not just to find a treaty, he says, but a lasting peace. Hochstein's visit to Beirut came after yet another sleepless night. Israel bombarded southern neighborhoods, this time targeting branches of a foundation the Israelis say Iran uses to finance Hezbollah. Just tonight, a new round of airstrikes south of Beirut coming perilously close to the city's airport. After a month of these relentless attacks, the streets of Beirut are teeming with people who have fled areas where Israel is targeting Hezbollah. There is safety here, but even this refuge holds reminders of the conflict raging outside. Amidst the current crisis, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken headed to the Middle East to launch another attempt towards a ceasefire, seeking to revive negotiations to the end of the Gaza war and defuse the spillover conflict in Lebanon. Israeli strikes in Beirut's southern suburbs left this branch of a Hezbollah-linked financial institution in ruins. And in other parts of Lebanon on Monday, similar scenes. Israel has shown no sign of reining in its offensives in Lebanon and Gaza after killing the leaders of Hezbollah and of Hamas, militant groups that are both sponsored by Iran. In northern Gaza, residents and medics say Israeli military forces besieged shelters for displaced people, as well as hospitals. The wounded were brought to this hospital in Jabalia. More than two dozen people were killed in strikes in Jabalia and elsewhere, Palestinian health officials said. In Beirut on Monday, there was a push for diplomacy. The Arab League secretary general called for an immediate ceasefire in Lebanon. <laughs> And U.S. Special Envoy Amos Hochstein said Washington is working on a formula to end the conflict between Israel and Hezbollah. He said it was not enough for both sides to commit to U.N. Resolution 1701, which ended the last round of conflict in 2006. On the streets of Beirut, residents say they're not holding their breath. He's been here twice, three times, four times, and he'll come 20 more times. It's all a waste of time, this man said. The efforts come ahead of a visit by U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, his 11th since the attack on Israel by Hamas that triggered the Gaza war. Israel's campaign in Lebanon has driven 1.2 million people from their homes. People had been sheltering at this abandoned hotel in Beirut until security forces moved in to evict them. Israel says it wants to drive out Hezbollah fighters from the border region so tens of thousands of Israelis can return. They've been forced to flee over the past year due to cross-border fire from Hezbollah launched in solidarity with Palestinians. Israel launched its campaign in Gaza after the October 7th attack that killed around 1,200 people, with hundreds more taken hostage, according to Israeli tallies. Israel's campaign in Gaza has killed more than 42,500 people, according to Palestinian officials. Thousands of flag-waving demonstrators hit the street across Spain's Canary Islands to demand restrictions to the mass tourism they say is overwhelming their Atlantic archipelago. These locals are not here to catch the sun, but to protest against mass tourism on the Canary Islands, chanting slogans and holding banners that say this is not tourism, this is colonialism, and Tenerife is not for sale. Canarians say tourism is driving prices up, pushing locals out of the housing market and putting them at risk of poverty. 
As they march past tourists having lunch by the sea, they shout at them to go home. The Canary Islands saw a record 16.2 million visitors in 2023. That's more than seven times its population of 2.2 million. And between January and September this year, 9.9 .9 million tourists already flocked to the islands. Some 10,000 locals protested across places like Gran Canaria, Tenerife and Fuerteventura, calling for limits on tourist numbers and a crackdown on holiday apartments. The demonstrations follow larger anti-tourism protests which spread across Spain in recent months. This is a major issue for the country where the tourism sector makes up 12.8% of its economy. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. And finally tonight, scientists in Colombia say they have developed a novel food supplement that protects bees' brains from pesticides keeping the insects safe from neurological damage caused by agricultural chemicals. This bee is being fed a supplement. Scientists in Colombia say the food could help protect bees' brains from pesticides. Andre Riveros is an associate professor at Rosario University in Bogota. Bees are pollinators. They're considered essential for preserving natural ecosystems and producing food but neurotoxins commonly used in agriculture can harm their motor system and memory. Multiple universities teamed up to create the formula. Initially, the insects were sedated, placed in test tubes, and then fed one by one. Testing has now moved to a university apiary. And with that, we mark the end of today's video. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest updates across the globe. Stay tuned that Sanavi Mudanayaka will join you next with the nightly business report. Until then, thank you for watching and have a good night.